Recently, somebody sent me this mock draft, which was in a Reddit forum, and I read through it and thought, this is a pretty good mock draft. And there's all sorts of awful, terrible mock drafts out in the mainstream at the moment. Uh, basically, every mock draft is awful. And, you know, that's the case most years. But at the, for some reason this year, it, it's a particularly terrible year for mock drafts. And so here we go. I'm going to bring it up onto the screen now. So, so this is it. Um, you can just about see on the screen some of the, the pics and the information there. So it's by somebody called Hawkfan907. So I'm guessing they're a Seahawks fan. Um, they listed a, a bunch of sources for, as you can probably see there on the screen, as to ha help them make this uh, mock draft. Uh, there's some names on there that they could probably get rid of, quite frankly. And, you know, there is one noticeable name that is missing that could probably help him out, but there we go. Um, and then he kind of runs through some of the things that, you know, have helped him put this mock draft together. And, and a lot of these things we've we've talked about on the blog. And I think that the good thing is, is that what he he's actually, by doing it this way, and he, he does it for the quarterbacks and he does it for the defensive linemen and the linebackers and the offensive line and stuff like that. When you actually do it this way, it, and you actually say, OK, what is the league thinking about Bryce Young? He says here that size is an obvious concern, but, you know, in the media, he seems to be the consensus number one. And he, and he quotes Todd McShay doing that. Uh, you know, by, by actually breaking it down in, and looking at each player, what, what are people actually saying? What has been reported by trusted sources? What are some of the concerns? What are the pros? Traditionally, what does like a, a concern about arm length on an offensive lineman, how will that impact their stock? How has it impacted it in the past? By doing it this way, I think you come up with a better process. I think the problem with a lot of mock drafts is they're kind of just like someone sits down and goes, right, what does this team need? They need a quarterback. I'll stick one there. This team needs an offensive lineman. I'll stick one there, which is where you end up with these mock drafts that have like Broderick Jones in the top 10. I mean, the guy can't actually block with his head up in the air looking at the person he's trying to block. He looks down at his feet and people are putting him at number eight overall. Now, if he goes to the combine, has got longer arms than everybody thinks because I think he's got guard size and there's a brilliant testing thing. Maybe I'll put him in the top 10 of a mock draft. But until then, what you watch on tape is not a top 10 left tackle. And yet people put him at number eight because, ah, this team needs an offensive lineman. We'll just put one there. All right? It doesn't make any sense. So anyway, keep going down. Um, you know, if, again, by doing it this process here, he even includes that Jalen Carter has had some uh, some apparent on the field has had apparent on the field issues from McShay's put conditioning and work ethic. McShay didn't actually cite that. We we've been talking about the conditioning. Other people just picked up on the conditioning against Ohio State. We actually picked up on it against LSU as well. We've highlighted the interview that he did where he said it was a priority. Didn't seem to address that during the season. Lance Zeeling, he should probably include that into his source as well in his draft page. I don't think many people realise that you can actually get Lance Zeeling's um, draft breakdowns by uh, going on on Daniel Jeremiah's top 50 and just clicking on the names of the players. But Lance Zeeling mentioned some character concerns as well, some maturity question marks. But you get the point. I'll put a link to the whole thing in the description if you want to read through all of these. Uh, he includes some trades. So Indianapolis going up to number one to jump Houston to grab QB1. He has Tennessee going up from number 11 to the third overall pick. And he has Carolina going up to number six. He also has the Giants trading up with Seattle to move down from 20. And he's got the Cowboys moving up. So let's get on with the, the mock draft. And the first thing that stands out for me is the three quarterbacks go in in the top three. Now, I, I think that does make a lot of sense. I've, I've been talking about that. Um, there was a report from Jeff Howe in The Athletic not so long ago saying that the league believes there is like a, a top three QBs and they are Levis, Young and Stroud. And then there's Anthony Richardson, who's just a notch behind. And I do think that's what the league will, will think about this quarterback class. I mean, I still think there's a chance that Anthony Richardson could get into that sort of top three mix. And I do think there will be some concerns about Bryce Young's size. But I also think that, yeah, there's probably, if, if he turns up at the combine, drinks two jugs of water and he's 205 pounds, some of those fears will be allayed going into the draft. So I think that what he's proposing here, will Levis, number one, 
Young 2 and Stroud 3 isn't totally unbelievable. There's been a lot of nonsense. I keep saying this, said about Will Levis. People completely misdiagnosing what happened with him in 2022. Kentucky were a mess, lost two key offensive linemen, lost uh, Wondell Robinson in the second round to the NFL, running back suspended, change of offensive coordinator who was essentially canned after one year and they brought the other guy back. There are there are reasons to believe that Levis, what he showed in 2021, is is what teams will look at more than anything. They will go back and look at that tape and and see a player who can operate within uh, an NFL scheme, the scheme that Sean McVay runs, and I think people will believe in him. Now, will he go first overall? I think CJ Stroud is going to go first overall. I think people are going to look at his performance against Georgia and say, we needed to see that. And now we've seen it, so we're going to put him at number one. Um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if Levis goes two, and I certainly wouldn't be surprised if he goes three and someone trades up to, to, to swap picks with Arizona and take him there. So I think that sort of having three quarterbacks at the top makes a lot of sense. Now, whether it's Tennessee who comes up from 11 or whether it's Carolina that comes up from nine, that's debatable and we'll, we'll see what happens there. But if you've got three quarterbacks at the top, I think what we'll see in the, in the coming weeks I'm not sure if I'm before the combine or just after the combine. I think we will see teams moving into the top three, making the best offers to Chicago, making their best offers to Arizona, seeing if they can get into the top three to guarantee the top quarterbacks. That's what teams have done for years. It's what we saw in the 2018 draft with teams positioning. Uh, we saw it when the Jared Goff and Carson Wentz years, you know, the two teams who picked first and second overall traded into those positions. We saw it with Trey Lance when the Niners traded into the top three, knowing they would guarantee one of the top three quarterbacks. They traded into that position um, well in advance of the draft. And I think we're going to see it again. So I think we will see teams trading into the top three. And we, we will, as we get close to the draft, we will have one, two, three quarterbacks. And it will set up this situation that we see at four and five, which is Chicago taking Will Anderson. And I do think he will be the first taken because he has none of the character concerns, none of the effort and conditioning concerns of Jalen Carter. And assuming that he tests reasonably well, then he will be he will probably be the first defensive lineman taken, first defender taken in the draft. And that will leave uh Seattle with a choice. And I and I do think there's a very likely chance that this will be their choice, that it'll be Jalen Carter or Anthony Richardson, who are the next two players taken. And it's whether or not John Schneider sees enough in Anthony Richardson to believe that he's got superstar status. Now when you look at Richardson's tape, and the more people actually dig into it, they do see that there are issues, as there are with most quarterbacks coming into the league. You know, there are very few Joe Burrows. And most quarterbacks have flaws. And he has definitely got flaws. With accuracy, I think a lot of it is down to inexperience. So if you want to call him raw because of that, then that's fine. I don't prefer to use that. I think I think it's more a case of the more he plays and the more time he spends on a football field, some of the, the kinks will be ironed out. And you will see rapid improvement from him because he has all of the tools, all of the skills that you need to be a top, top player. He has shown an ability to go through progressions, to read defences, to play in, a, in something akin to a pro scheme. He is a, a, such a dynamic athlete as a runner and as a thrower. So I, I can imagine the Seahawks having a lot of interest in him. One thing you've got to remember with John Schneider is he has really been enamoured by arm talent. They traded for one of the first things Schneider and Carroll did was trade for Charlie Whitehurst. People forget about that. That trade cost Seattle a third round pick and they swapped picks, went from the, the very top of round two to the very bottom of round two in a trade with the then San Diego Chargers. So it wasn't just a third round pick for Charlie Whitehurst. They basically dropped a round in round two as well because they dropped so far down the board to get Charlie Whitehurst. Not because of any, just simply because John Schneider liked him in college and he had a big arm and size. And then you look at um, the interest in Josh Allen, massively flawed, but an amazing athlete, great arm. Patrick Mahomes, ton of interceptions, not a great record in college, but has a big arm, very skilled as a passer. Russell Wilson, big arm, you know, short, but had all of the tools of a bigger quarterback. These are things to remember as we kind of go through this process, because people are, oh, Will Levis, ah, oh, you know, no. big arm, traits, good character. I think John Schneider is going to love Will Levis, frankly. Um, CJ Stroud, big arm, 
traits, athletic, good size. Anthony Richardson, huge arm, traits, 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 traits similar to Josh Allen, outstanding athlete. Could well imagine the Seahawks going, yeah, do you know what? We're going to take Anthony Richardson above number uh, five in this situation. Could easily imagine that. And people should prepare themselves for that, whether they re-sign Geno Smith or not. Re-signing Geno Smith is not going to have any consequences on what they do. The media will tell you that it will when, when Smith, if, when Smith signs. That's it. They don't need a quarterback now. It's defense all the way at number five. That's what you're going to hear from the local and the national media. It won't mean anything because... You, if, if you if you plan to draft a quarterback, what's the best thing you could do tactically for a draft? It's it's give the indication that you are not going to go quarterback in the draft. And let's assume that any deal Geno Smith signs, even if it's like a big hundred million dollar deal for three years or something, probably be a low cap hit in year one and an easy out for the Seahawks in year two. So that that that's how I sort of view that. Anthony Richardson could do with a red shirt year anyway. So I think that he would be on the radar in this situation. However. Jalen Carter, you know, if the Seahawks take him in number five, I can understand why they would do that. Might be the most talented player in the draft. I think probably second behind B. John Robinson for me in terms of pure talent, not thinking about positional value here, just in terms of pure talent. Might be the second best player in the draft. Some will say first. Big position of need. They've long needed somebody who can disrupt up the middle. If you address that need now, then you feel like, okay, that, that, that's, a, that's a player who can, can have an impact for you. If he turns into the player that he has the talent to become, he can be special. The only problem is, is whether he's going to work at that and whether it really matters to him enough to do it. And when he gets to the to the pros, is he going to have that sort of mentality of, I want to be the best? Or is it going to be enough for him to simply be in the pros and be a multimillionaire? That's sort of my concerns with that, because when you have things like going up to a podium and saying, conditioning's my priority for this season, to improve that, and then you get to the, the most important games of your season, the SEC Championship, the college football playoff semi-final against they were visibly exhausted in a way that I've never seen a player so exhausted on a football field before. And that's just from basically doing his job and playing a, a reasonable amount of snaps. That That is a bit of a concern. So the Seahawks will have to make that judgment on Jalen Carter. And I don't think that's been talked about enough. You know, it's almost like people are a bit embarrassed to talk about it now in this sort of Twitter social media day that we live in, it almost feels unfair to criticise, to, to point out what actually might be going on behind closed doors in the NFL, which is what Todd McShay said, that there are some concerns about Jalen Carter. McShay's quote was, whether you want him in your locker room. And Lance Ealing's mentioned about his maturity. And now we have the conditioning stuff. So it is a question mark whether you want to take a chance on Jalen Carter there. And I think there will be some concern. You know, people talk about, I always people always send me messages about the risk of drafting a quarterback at number five. And I'm thinking, what about the risk of, of Jalen Carter, you know, with all of this stuff? Is that not a risk as well? I mean, any player that you take at five is going to be a risk. If you don't take a quarter, if you don't take Anthony Richardson here, for example, and he goes on to be the next Josh Allen, the next Patrick Mahomes, and, it, that's, and, you, and you passed, you're just going to be one of those teams who, who didn't take Mahomes, who was the 10th overall pick. You're going to, everyone's going to be talking about those teams who didn't. Imagine being the team who paid Geno Smith a big contract didn't take Anthony Richardson, then he goes on and becomes the face of the NFL. We're going to be talking about that forever. That's a risk to take a defensive tackle instead. That's as much of a risk as saying, well, we're going to be the team that tries to take Anthony Richardson and make him that superstar. So uh, those are things to consider. However, I think this mock makes sense. This is what I've done, I think, in two out of my three mock drafts so far. Uh, I can't remember how many I've done now, but certainly Jalen Carter at number five. And I think this is it's a very plausible. Your three quarterbacks in the top three, Will Anderson going at four to Chicago after they trade down and then you take Jalen Carter. I think that makes a lot of sense. All I'm saying is Anthony Richardson, I wouldn't be surprised if Carolina did trade up to number six in this in this kind of situation here, if this plays out like it like this mock suggesting, and they take Anthony Richardson. Okay, uh, Christian Gonzalez at the number, uh, at number seven, I, I'd be a bit surprised. I think that's a bit too early, but um, he is he's very athletic, very competitive. Cornerbacks a premium position. I, and look, I like Christian Gonzalez. He's on my horizontal board now as the top top cornerback, having done a little bit more study over the last couple of weeks. And I think because of the way he'll test at the combine, there is a chance that he he will go a bit earlier than I've been projecting. I've got him in the teens. 
But I do think there's a little bit too much shoehorning of cornerbacks into the top 10. I don't think any of these cornerbacks deserve to go in the top 10. They've got three going in the top 10 here. So um, I'm, I wouldn't be totally stunned, but I think they're more, all of these cornerbacks, the, the three of them that go here, are 10 to 20 players rather than seven, nine and 10 like they are here. Uh, Tyree Wilson to Atlanta in this sort of situation that makes sense. Uh, number eight overall. I think with Tyree Wilson, the length and the size is amazing. I just want to see him test. Now, because of that ankle injury that he got at the end of the season, I wonder if he will be ready for the combine or not. Obviously, he wasn't ready for the senior bowl. Um, I want to see him test and do really well because he can't just be have long arms and a big frame. You, you've got to actually show some athletic dynamism as well. If he can show that at the combine, who knows? I mean, I think he could legitimately be an option for the Seahawks number five, even instead of Jalen Carter, if he tests well. If he says, "Look at the upside, I've got to go with the length." The, you know, the, I've got explosive traits and got a great short shuttle. I've got the agility. Then teams will start thinking, "Yes, you know, this is a you know a, a unique athlete that we have to take." And then he could even go ahead of somebody like Jalen Carter, who's got some character concerns. If he is basically just tall, big, and long but doesn't have explosive traits or agility, then he's not going to go as, as high as some people are suggesting. So combine will be big for Tyree Wilson, or if he doesn't work out at the combine, a pro day. Uh, Devin Witherspoon is very much a Detroit type of player. And I mean, as he says here, Campbell and Witherspoon are a match made in heaven. I tend to agree with that. Whether or not he goes that early. I mean, the thing is, he might run a 4-5-6. And then if he runs a 4-5-6, can you take a cornerback who runs that kind of a time at number, number nine overall, as this is, I'm not sure. Number 10 overall to Philadelphia, Joey Porter Jr. I think that the Eagles are going to have to replenish some of their secondary depth. Both of their safeties are out of contract. That's why I've been putting uh, Brian Branch to Philadelphia in this spot. Uh, Joey Porter, though, would be, you know, I, I think he's a very good player. And I can see why this could happen. If the, if the cornerbacks get pushed up a bit, then I can see why that could happen. Arizona, having moved down to number 11 in that trade with Tennessee, have got Miles Murphy uh, at Clemson. I think Miles Murphy is going to last longer than people think. Like the, the media is just so caught up on, oh, he's athletic, isn't he? And, and I keep reading things that make me think people haven't actually watched him play. And as someone who watched all of Clemson's games uh, last season, because I wanted to watch Murphy and I wanted to watch. Uh, KJ Henry, and I wanted to watch the you know Brian Brissy, and I wanted you know all of those guys. I wanted to watch them all because it, it, the season was going along. It was looking like maybe Seahawks are going to take a defensive line, and I wanted to watch the best. So I watched Clemson. I just didn't see it. I just did not see enough from Miles Murphy to think he's a top ten pick. I mean, yeah, he may well test well, but as a pass rusher and as an all round player, I just didn't see it. It was it was. He didn't start two of their games. He was coming off the bench. KJ Henry was much more disruptive consistently through the season. I, I just think people are I think people are assuming he's something he isn't. And I think he could last longer than number 11. But I'm glad to see that this mock draft hasn't got him going like sixth overall or something, which is like a lot of people have. So I just don't think that's going to happen. Uh, Lucas Van Ness. I don't really agree with Lucas Van Ness here at number 12. Let's see how he tests. But I, I just have a hard time putting a player at number 12 overall who didn't didn't start for Iowa. He was a player who was kind of spelled in and out. And if he was 12th overall pick, I, I just have a hard time thinking that that a team like Iowa, who have been good for a number of years, wouldn't have him playing pretty much every defensive snap. I mean, I just just me. So we'll see how he tests. He looks very athletic, and if he tests very well, maybe someone will say, look, um, we didn't think that J.J. Watt was going to be J.J. Watt. We didn't think T.J. Watt was going to be T.J. Watt. Otherwise, he wouldn't have lasted to like 27th or 29th overall. And maybe someone will say, look, Lucas Van Ness is going to be like similar to that. So we'll see how he tests. Uh, 13, Peter Skaronski. I don't think the Jets are going to take a guard at number 13. Uh, and that's what he is. He's a guard because he's going to have short arms. I think that they, I mean, take, you know, if you take one guard, I think they already took... Vera Tucker, uh, Elijah Vera Tucker with, I think, was was that the 13th pick? They traded up to get him in the 13th overall pick uh, was it a couple of years ago now. I, I can't imagine the Jets spending two 13 overall picks or two picks in the early teens on guards 
That, that just doesn't make sense to me. So I don't think they will do that. And I don't think Peter Scrunz is going to go this, this early. Again, if he tests well, fine. I know that in the recruitment, you know, he's considered Northwestern's. Was he something like their first ever five-star player or the first five-star player to commit to them in a long time or something like that? Uh, I know others have got him as a four-star in recruitment. So I, let's see how he tests. I mean, he's a good player, but I think he's somebody who's more likely to go later in the first round. Brian Branch, 14 to New England, would be the ideal fit. Would be a perfect fit. Team and player. He's the kind of safety that they love to draft. Green Bay, Michael Mayer at number 15 would, again, I think that'd be a perfect match. Whether Aaron Rodgers is there or not, it's, it's a good team for Mayer. Offense would suit him. Team would suit him. Kind of that, you know, working class, cold weather, proper footballing team. That's 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 Mayer for me. I think people are underrating Michael Mayer. He's he's got he's one of those players who's kind of been so prominent for a long time that I think people are overthinking this. And I, and I don't really care whether he runs in the four eights. It's whether or not his short shuttle is good or not. That that's really what it matters. It's that short area agility and quickness. Let's see what his ten yard split is. Tight ends do not need to run a four four. We've seen plenty of tight ends who run four fours, four fives, and flame out in the league. They are not running 40 yards downfield very, very often. What they are doing is having to separate from very quick nickel cornerbacks and linebackers over the second level, over the middle on crossing routes. They just need that quick, sharp blast of acceleration to separate, or they need to have that late, subtle separation with agility. And you see Michael Mayer do that over and over again. I am convinced he's going to have a, a good short shuttle. Maybe not amazing. I'm not thinking he's going to do a 4.05 or something like that. But I think he's got enough agility to be able to separate in key areas and you know given that i think the seahawks should just be basically drafting best player available at every single spot with the caveat of can you get a great quarterback at number number five and if if michael mayer lasts to number 20 i'd be all over that frankly as i would be and the, the, the sort of the one big complaint I have about smart draft is that i can already tell that Bijan robinson is not off the board and he, and he will be by this point there is no way he's going to last as long as some people think Anyway, Cam Smith to Washington at number 16. Makes some sense. They need a cornerback. I think teams are going to really like Cam Smith. Pittsburgh, Dewan Jones. Completely agree. I think this would be a, a great match for, for team. I mean, he, he's a Pittsburgh kind of player. I think the Seahawks should consider taking him at number 20. And I love A. Lucas. But um, I, I don't, you know, it's just, I, if you've got to beat teams up in the trenches, and you take Jalen Carter at number five, and then you get Dewan Jones at number 20, and then you put Abe Lucas at right guard, well, you're going to beat a lot of teams in the trenches, and, and that would be a really positive thing to see that. Uh, Detroit, number 18, Kalaja Kansi. Yeah, I, I mean, this is the kind of range I think Kansi will go. I don't, you know, Aaron Donald went in a certain range, and, and Kansi isn't Donald. They are similar and will test very similarly. But I do think that Kansi, just his production and his, you know, he didn't, he wasn't at the, like Aaron Donald on an amazing senior bowl. Kansi wasn't at the senior bowl. So, you know, there are little things that weigh against him, but I don't think he's going to go that much later than Aaron Donald. And I can see him kind of going in this range. Keon White, 19. I can definitely see him going that early. I still think that he needs to learn how to convert speed to power better. But the fact that he can, if he can get that right, he can be dominant, really works in his favor. Because he has everything. Size, speed, power. He's going to test brilliantly. Very, very interesting player. Uh, the Giants trade up into Seattle spot to take Quinton Johnston. I think that when Johnston, when he's tested at the Combine, and I feel this way about Jalen Hyatt as well, when he's tested at the Combine, I think his stock's just going to go, whoosh, and, and like, I think he's going to go higher than this. But we'll see, because there are some inconsistencies to his game. But I kind of look at him as, at times his frame reminds me a little bit. The way he runs is very similar to the way Richard Sherman runs. And his frame is so tall and big. He is the kind of player that teams like to invest in. So whether he lasts this long or not, I'm not sure. But I do think it's realistic that if he does get to sort of late teens, 20, that we could see someone like the Giants who need a number one 
going up to get him. So I think that makes sense. Bijan Robinson at 20, is 22 because Miami forfeited their pick. I, 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 I don't think there's any way that he lasts this long. And I see so many people. The thing here's what the what I've sort of read and heard about Bijan Robinson that a lot of teams are going to have him as the best player in the draft. A lot of teams think he's better than Saquon Barkley and Zeke Elliott and people like that who've gone in the top five. People think that he can be as good as Christian McCaffrey as a receiver. Now, when I hear all those things, and I think, okay, and Saquon Barkley went second, and Zeke was like fourth overall, I think, or five overall, and Christian McCaffrey was a top 10 pick, he was like eighth overall. Why is Bijan Robinson going 22nd overall? Because the reason why, the you know, uh, Ken Walker and Bryce Hall, um, Brees Hall went second round last year, you know, that... They were not. They were not talked about like Bijan Robinson is like the best player in the draft. They were talked about as really good running backs, They're better than expected at the combine, and you know that's why they kind of went where they went. You know, Bijan Robinson is legitimately the for me first or second best player in the draft. I just do not see any way like someone will take him in the top fifteen. Someone is going to say, "Yeah, the positional value is what it is," but this guy's amazing. We're taking him. It could be the Lions. I mean, I don't think the Lions are going to pass him twice. Not with the way that they play. It could be the Eagles. It could be the Cardinals. They, there's, there's a whole bunch. It could be the Seahawks. I mean, I think if he lasts to 20, you run to the podium. Frankly, you probably don't trade down with the Giants. You take B. John Robinson because he's that good. I mean, if you want to play running game and defense like Seattle, I know you've got Ken Walker, but... Whew, I mean, you'd be talking about one of the best one-two punches probably in NFL history if you had Bijan Robinson and Ken Walker. So, yeah, I, I just I, I don't see him lasting this long. If he does, congratulations to the LA Chargers. But I, I just don't see it. I think he's a top, a top 15 lock for me, and I will not do a mock draft without him in the top 10. Dallas Jordan Addison, receiver, they, they do. It does feel like they need another weapon, and I could definitely see them doing that. The defense is good. Offensive line's another op option here. But yeah, I could see that. Kali Ringo, I mean, it, it's described as a fall. I don't think Kali Ringo going, this is 24th overall to Minnesota. I don't think that's a fall. I think it probably last a bit longer than this because, yeah, great athlete, good size, but massively inconsistent. And, and Trevon Diggs fell because he was the same thing. You know, made big plays for Alabama, also massively inconsistent. Also a great athlete. Kali Ringo's in the same boat. So I think Kali Ringo will go in the same range that Trevon Diggs went. So I don't see this as a fall. So I disagree with that. Luke Musgrave, uh, who's getting... Luke Musgrave is getting talked about as the first tight end potential of the board. People saying he's going to go in the top 15, mocking that. You know, I've looked at that myself. The reason he could last to 25, as he does in this mock draft to Jacksonville, is because he played two games last year, has been injured, and has, I think, two career touchdowns. So what you are drafting somebody based on potential here and, you know, what he could become. You are not drafting based on anything he's shown in, in college. But what he could become is a complete tight end. He's going to have an amazing combine and the sky's limit for it. And you just sort of to watch him at the senior bowl, the way he was running around the field was gliding almost. He's, he's such a special athlete for his size that... He's going to go in the first round, but um, he could easily last to this kind of range because of the lack of production and the injury uh, at Oregon State that he had this year, which prevented him from really having the impact in college that people were expecting. Seattle have traded down to 26 and then take John Michael Schmitz. So one of the reasons why I want to do this mock draft is I did want to spend a bit of time talking about this. This has become kind of a trendy pick. It's a pick that Seahawks fans love, and I get why they love it, because the Seahawks have needed a centre for a long time. They've obviously passed on great centres like Creed Humphrey um, and taken D. Eskridge instead, and there's a lot of fans who are very angry about that. And that anger will remain until they 
find an answer at centre. Now, there is a couple of things to remember here. I do think Seahawks fans have gone a little bit over the top on the centre position. I don't, I don't watch the, the or listen to the the Kelsey Brothers podcast. Um, I don't listen to that many podcasts, and I don't listen to that one. But I did watch a clip of it going into the Super Bowl, and Jason Kelsey and uh, Travis Kelsey were obviously talking about who could play each other's position best. And Jason Kelsey was saying, ah, Travis, you'd get blown up playing centre and I could run around or something or I could block off the edge. And they were having that conversation. And Travis countered by saying, yeah, but centre's probably the one position in on the offensive line that you could hide somebody. Hide a, an inadequate player. To which Jason Kelsey went, yeah, I agree with that. And, that, and I found that was interesting because I think that's that's the thing that we have to remember here. This isn't a Seahawks thing. This isn't just some zany kind of thought that John Schneider and Pete Carroll have. That's what the league thinks. You just have to look. You, there aren't many centers that go in the first round. Often the top center goes in the second round. Often if you see a center go very, very early, they are either a major athlete or they have had an amazing college career, or they're just overdrafted to fill a need. And, and we have to remember that. We have to remember that. Like, yes, it's frustrating that the Seahawks have had a, have tried a number of different centres and none of them have worked. And yes, it would be nice to have some consistency there. But it is what Jason Kelsey said, a position that if you were going to have any position on the line that wasn't, expensive, highly drafted. If it had to be a guy that you could just kind of just put out there who's a scheme fit, it is centre who's, if you're going to make a save in anywhere, that's the role. Now, I don't think that Seattle got amazing centre play last season. Um, but what I would say is with the scheme that they've gone for, it's, it's that type of player in Austin Blythe who has, has excelled in the Rams system. And it is a system that has like smaller leverage type centers. And for years, the Rams had the best pass blocking offensive line in the league. That went away last year because they had a ridiculous number of injuries uh, across the board, especially on the offensive line. And they never really got, got going there. But that, that scheme has enabled that. So do the, if you said to me, do the Seahawks need to spend a first round pick on a centre? I would say no. That's the first thing I would say. And I know that's going to, that, I'm probably on, a, on an island of about five others in that regard who think that because everybody wants Seattle to draft a centre and, and sort that situation out and they'll be very happy with it. And they'll think it's an amazing pick and all of that. I, I don't think, I mean, I I just don't, I don't think it's necessary. I think if there was a great centre standing out, then yeah, fine. But I, I don't think John My Michael Schmitz is, is a great centre. I think there are things to like about him. So if you put the tape on, you will see plays that you need to make in Seattle scheme to be very effective, which is to sort of chip and block initially off the snap and then get up to the second level. And it's that sort of bang, bang sort of situation where the center sort of deflects off, off the defensive lineman, does enough so the running back can hit that hole, runs in behind the center who is reached up to the second level and then locks onto a overmax linebacker. And there are plenty of examples like that on tape. So you can make a case for John Michael Schmitz in Seattle and say he can do this scheme. I, I completely agree with that. There are also plays where he's, you know, some of the issues that people see with Austin Blythe, you see with uh, John Michael Schmitz, where he is pushed around a little bit, uh, where he's perhaps not most powerful on contact. Um, he is a kind of get in the way type player a lot of the time. And, and I just, for me, there just was, there wasn't anything that particularly special about him. Now, maybe I'm completely wrong and he'll get to the combine and be an outstanding athlete and he'll justify the 26th overall pick. But at the moment, I've got a third round grade on him and I'm willing, based on testing, to move that up around if needs be and put him in the second round. 
which is the highest he will ever go. I will never give John Michael Schmitz a first round grade because I don't think he. I've only got. I have got what four, five, six, seven, eight, nine first round, true first round grades for this draft class. That's the kind of class it is, and I have a, hot, a handful of other players who are more than a handful, quite a decent chunk of players who I think are fringe first round grades. But for me, Michael Schmitz will always be his best firmly in that second round range. So I'm, I'm putting him in round three now with the opportunity to move up. But I think that you could easily just as well make a case for Luke Weipler a bit later on. You could easily make a case for Joe Tipman. He's not the kind of centre they want, though. He's six foot six or whatever. He's a great athlete, but he's, he's, he's taller. They want leverage. Pete Carroll said that last year. Cody Mork, I think, showed at the Senior Bowl that he's not a tackle, but he could be a really good centre. So there's that option. Um, and I think it was you, you go down. I thought Juice Scruggs was interesting at the Shrine game. Um, Oliver Timi at Michigan, I think he's, he's such a, a weak athlete that I think that's going to be a bit of an issue there. But Alex Forsyth, who's had some injury issues, but I, I do think can do a job from Oregon. I, I just don't think you necessarily need to go out there and spend the 26 overall pick on John Michael Schmidt. For me, that's my personal opinion. I don't think you need to do that. I think if you were going to draft any position at 20 or 26 in this case, you'd be better off sort of looking for a right guard who can dominate because, again, you can hide a centre. And the other option is you take Darnell Wright, who is available on this in this mock draft, and you either put him at guard or you can kick Abe Lucas inside. So I'm not a big fan of John Michael Schmitz here, but I <laughs> I acknowledge that Seahawks fans are going to love this. Baltimore at 27, Zay Flowers makes sense. They have a need. They've had a need at receiver every year for like the last 15 years. 28, Buffalo, Broderick Jones could see this kind of range. This is, the you know, for me, he's late first, early second. Good to see. I like the fact that this mock draft has Paris Johnson Jr. this late. It should be 29 to Cincinnati. I think that's right, isn't it? 26, 27, 28, 29. Yeah. Paris Johnson, whenever I see him in the top 10, I immediately click off the mock draft because I, I just don't see it. I don't see special. And I can't remember the guy's name now. I think he had a French name. Which is funny because this guy's called Paris. Um, Nicolas Petit Frere. Was that the name of the guy last year? And which means little brother, funny enough. Uh, he was he was talked about this time last year as a first round pick. And I can't remember where I ended up going. It certainly wasn't in the first round. And I kind of I feel the same way about Paris Johnson. I just don't think he's a spectacular left tackle. He's not a left tackle to go in the top ten. Again. If he comes in with 35-inch arms and tests through the roof, you can start to talk that way because he will he will be a prototype. But no one's talking about him in those terms. It's not expected. So I, I have to see that to believe it, and I just don't think he's going to go as high as people think. Good to see Brian Brassig last into number 30 here because this, again, for me, he's going to go between 30 and 45 just because of the inconsistent play the injuries and the health and the fact that he hasn't played that much for the last couple of years. And there is some concerns about short arms. So I, he's going to last. He's, there's no doubt. And he's, he's very athletic, a lot of upside physically, but you can't justify taking him earlier than this. So I'm, it's a good thing for this mock draft to have him this late. Darnell Wright, 31 to Kansas City. I think he's going to go a bit earlier than this, but I understand why, you know, if he doesn't test brilliantly, he could could last to this range. And then Will McDonald, who, you know, I think in my next mock draft, I'm going to put in the top 20 because his tape in 2022 was disappointing. You wanted to sort of see him have a big year and really go into the draft, you know, top 15 pick type thing and really make a statement. And he didn't do that. I think the scheme didn't help him. The way that they asked him to play kind of, a, you know, as a traditional defensive end when really he's more of an outside linebacker, Russia type player. That didn't help. But when you see him at the Senior Bowl, and, and I've watched all of his 1v1s now, it's just it's unbelievable. 
without a shadow of a doubt, the best pass rusher at the senior bowl. His ability to bend and straighten is freakish. His balance to round the arc is incredible. He has 35-inch arms, typical lean pass rushing frame. You can keep his frame clean. And when you can keep your frame clean and you are as quick as he is, that's a scary combination. And he's supposedly able to like jump at a 42-inch vertical to his explosive. He's supposedly going to run very quick. Great agility testing. So what you're basically saying here is he's the perfect package for a team who wants an outside rusher. And I think he will... He, I mean, he looks like a praying mantis physically. And, I, and I, he's exactly the kind of player that the Seahawks love to draft for that position. So I would not be surprised at all if the Seahawks seriously consider taking him at number 20. I know they've got sort of some some pass rushes already who kind of like he's Daryl Taylor's that sort of same physical player. Boya Mafe only drafted a year ago. But I, I think it's it's entirely possible that they may just think we can't, you know, we've got to take Will McDonald here. And I think there is a chance that he will go in the top 15 because of his upside, if not top 15, top 20. But it would make a lot of sense for Philadelphia here. Quickly into round two, um, I, I I will pick through the picks because I, I, we're 40 minutes into the video and I don't want to just go through everything, but Emmanuel Forbes to Pittsburgh, they need a cornerback. That makes sense. Jalen Hyatt at 34 to Houston. I do not see Jalen Hyatt lasting that long. He's too good at separating. That late separation on his deep routes is unbelievable. He's too quick. If you watch the Hendon Hooker tape, on his highlights, just listen, count how many times you hear, wide open, as Hendon Hooker's throwing it downfield. That's one, because of the scheme, and two, because Jalen Hyatt's too good and just separates from everybody. So uh, he made Hendon Hooker look very good last year. Uh, Deontay Banks, I think it's a bit high for him, but a lot of people like him. Uh, Jackson Smith and Jigba, good to see him in round two to Chicago, because I think this is something he's getting overrated a little bit here. When you actually watch the tape, he's not sudden, he's not that quick. He's, he's not big. He can't really play outside. He's going to have to play in the slot. He missed most of last year with an injury. I think he's going to last a lot longer than people think. Um, Derek Cole to the LA Rams. I thought Derek Cole had a bit of a disappointing senior bowl. I don't see him going as high as this. I've got him in round three. So Seattle's next pick is Drew Sanders. I think Drew Sanders, if he tests well, will go in the top 20. I think the Jets, the Titans, possibly... The, I think of the other teams that might take him, but I just think with Micah Parsons playing as well as he is, teams are not going to think Drew Sanders is Micah Parsons because nobody is, but I think they'll think that they could get a poor man's version. And the fact that he can play off the edge, get nine and a half sacks, can play as an orthodox linebacker, he's like 6'5, 230, but he can easily get up to 240, flies to the football, big hitter, kind of Mr. Football type. I, I, I think he's going to go a lot earlier than this. If the Seahawks could come out of this with uh, Jalen Carter and Drew Sanders for their defense, their defense will get a massive upgrade. If you could put it as well, then hey, maybe they could recreate a, a, an amazing defense for the future as opposed to taking a center there. I don't know. Just just throwing it out there. But I I, I think Drew Sanders is going to go in the top 20 where they've got him going in early round two here. Uh, Jalen Duncan. To Las Vegas, I think this makes sense for his kind of range. Whether teams will be scared off by the length, I don't know if they'll feel like they've got to kick him inside to guard, but he is very athletic. He's admitted to test very well. There are some character issues, apparently. Um, not a great interviewer, it has to be said. I've listened to some of his interviews, not not amazing there. And and that might be a bit of an issue for teams. I just think he's, he's got a bit of, you know, do you need to like fly, fly under his ass? Um, but he had a good senior ball, and I could see teams, I mean, if they if Vegas Raiders take him. Are they going to play him at guard? Are they going to play him at right tackle? So they've got a left tackle. Uh, we'll see. Josh Downs to Carolina makes sense just because they need another receiver. And traded Ray Robbie Anderson, didn't they? They've only got uh, one receiver there, really. And if they're going to draft a quarterback, they need to get him another weapon. Osiris Torrance might be the most overrated player in the draft to New Orleans. Um, just, just go and watch the play where Ivan Pace, who's about 230 pounds, runs into 330 pounds si Osiris Torrance and dumps him on his backside. Go and watch the plays where he's driven five, six, seven yards into the backfield on the 1v1s. 
I have no idea why Osiris Torrance... It's, it's almost as if the Florida coach leaves Western Kentucky. He goes with him. People think, wow, this is interesting. He thinks he's good enough for the SEC. He gets a big billing. PFF gives him a great grade. Didn't really see it on tape. Because the senior ball, everybody's talking about how amazing he is. It seems like every year there's, the, there's like a big name who people have decided is going to be great at the senior bowl even before they've taken a rep. And Osiris Torrance was that guy for me this year. And I don't think he's as good as this. I've got him firmly in round. Never look. I've got him in round four. And I think he could go in round three. And I think that's fair, frankly. Uh, Marzi Smith, I think, will go higher than this because his combine is going to be amazing. But I accept the short arms could be a bit of an issue. Uh, Dayan Henley to Cleveland. I think this is a bit early. It will depend how he tests. Obviously, undersized. Had an amazing start to last season and tailed off in terms of production. Had a good senior ball by all accounts. Good in coverage. Might be a bit of an issue versus the run. But if he's a smaller, if you're a smaller linebacker, you need to test well. And if he tests well, then he's got a chance to go high. Antonio Johnson, I think, is a bit overrated. Goes to the Jets here. Safety. Tyreek Stevenson, a bit overrated for me, but has got the size. Anton Harrison, a bit overrated for me. Um, but a lot of people think he could go round one, round two. Nolan Smith to the to the Patriots is a perfect fit because they love these kind of tweenery linebacker edge types. That's the player that they draft. Bill Belichick will love Nolan Smith's character. I think it's a perfect fit. Could see, could definitely see that pick. Washington Steve Avia. Uh, Ron Rivera loves his big physical offensive lineman, so I could definitely see that. Detroit need a tight end, having traded away TJ Hawkinson. You know, don't necessarily need someone to lead the offense. They've got a good tight end on the roster, but you know, Donna Washington as, a, as an extra blocker slash occasional pass catcher makes some sense there. I, I've got him in round three because I just don't think he's much of a pass catcher, frankly. I, I don't think he's a dynamic athlete. I think he basically is like an, an, an extra offensive lineman. I do not think he's going to be a major passing threat in the NFL. Keanu Benton, be surprised if he lasts this long. He would have to test poorly, I think, to last to Pittsburgh here. I don't think he's going to last that line. He's too good. I think he showed at the Senior Bowl how good he is. I see him going anywhere from even 20 to Seattle to 40. I think that's kind of his range. Very, very good player. It's why I'm not too concerned. You know, if the Seahawks go quarterback first, there are enough defensive players late, you know, in round 20 and then at round two to get some good defensive linemen. And Keanu Benson's a good example of that. Kaya Blue Kelly, league apparently really likes him. So we can definitely see him going in round two. I think this is a bit late for Jameer Gibbs, who is just so unbelievably good, could run in the four threes. And I think he's going to go much higher than this. But running back positional value, I get it. Bit of an injury thing. Uh, one big year of production, really. I could see why he falls a little bit, but I think he's going to go. I think he'll go late first or top 40 for me, Jameer Gibbs. Uh, Seattle's last pick in this mock, Tuli Tui Pelotu. Um, it, it's going to come down to arm length. They spent, a, they, they put a lot of emphasis on arm, arm length in Seattle, and he is a bit of a tweener. He's not somebody who's got the length in terms of his torso. He's not that long, lean edge to play in space. He's not got the size to play as a as like a three technique or a, a traditional five technique. He's kind of somebody that you're going to put on the edge, like a big end just like for bulky and and you've got to hope that he's got enough twitch to do what he did in college. I mean, like when you actually watch him, he, he's a really hard player to, to analyze because he, he can, he like got a Euro step, he can swim, he can beat you just with get off and quickness off the edge. And you sort of see all those things and you think, mm, this is really interesting. But then there's a whole, and like he's got a great highlights video, which is about 10 minutes on YouTube. And if you watch that, you think he was a top 10 pick. But if you actually watch USC play, it's really weird. His snaps are like boom or bust. They're either like screams off the edge, makes a massive play, great sack, looks the biz. But then there's like 10 plays where he just gets easily blocked out and, and doesn't do anything. And it makes it a really hard player to assess. Like, how good is he? How much does this translate when he's not doing this in the Pac-12, when he's trying to do this in the NFL? Is it actually going to work across? I'm not sure about that. 
but you can't deny his production. You can't deny that he, the things that you want him to do well, and it's not just sort of like, like I said, that the, the ability to win off the edge with his with his athleticism or his hands, he can win with power as well. So he's he's a real interesting test case. I've got him like going to Arizona at the top of round two because I think he's their kind of player. You know, they don't tend to worry too much about length and they've, they've drafted a whole bunch of different guys like that. So I think there's a chance that that they would take him very early in round two. Um, I'm not convinced he's a Seahawks body type, but an interesting player nonetheless. Uh, and I do think he'll go a bit early in this just because of his pass rush production and what he did show on tape. Uh, but again, testing and measuring is going to be important for him. Uh, Cody Mock uh, to Chicago here. I think that that makes a lot of sense. I think his best position is going to be centre in the end, given his lack of length and his size. And I think he's a really interesting centre player. And this is why I kind of think, look, if you you don't need to take a centre at twenty or well, twenty six in this mock draft, you know, there, there's he's he goes here um, after Seattle in round two, and then you've got a whole bunch of you know Luke Wiper still on the board and. You know, Joe Tipman's still on the board, so you don't necessarily need to do that. And Garrett Bradbury, who's a free agent in Minnesota, I'd go and see what his price range is going to be because he's got ideal size for Seattle scheme from a number 18 overall pick. Didn't really work in Minnesota, but I, I, for me, that's the he, he'd be a player worth taking a look at in free agency. Jaden Reed had a great senior bowl. Jaden Reed, the receiver for Michigan State, how he runs a 40 is going to be so important. I enjoy watching his tape, not so much this last year because Michigan State were awful, but the year before. Really interesting tape. Showed a bit of that at the Senior Bowl. If he can run in the four fours, um, at least, then could start to rise. Hendon Hooker, I think, is a bit overrated. As I mentioned, I think the scheme really helped him. I think I don't think I've ever seen a quarterback highlight video where the commentator says "wide open" so many times on his throws. He had so many, so many wide open throws. It's it's laughable, frankly, and. I'm not sure when everything tightens up and the windows uh, for passing lanes are, are, are tighter and whether he has to sort of think without the benefit of having Jalen Hyatt and another top receiver on the end, on the other side, and with a great right tackle playing in front of him. I'm not sure whether or not he he can do that on a prolific SEC team that were dominating most of their games. I'm not sure he's going to come in the NFL and do that. He's already older than Jalen Hurts. He's already 25. Age is going to work against him. He's got a knee injury. So, I mean, I think the team that does take, I could imagine Seattle taking him, frankly, even in the end of round two. Maybe I, I think for me, I'd have him in sort of round three, round four as a better one. But I can see Seattle, if they miss out on a quarterback early, going, well, we're just going to take this guy, redshirt him for a year because the injury, chuck him into the mix next year and see if he can compete for a job. That, to me, is probably what they're going to do if they don't take a quarterback early because that makes some sense because there's not going to be any pressure on Geno Smith and or Drew Lott this year from. Hooker coming in because of his injury, because he's just going to be recovering, which means he can then spend some time learning the scheme and taking his time. And then in a year's time, you've got a player who can either win that job or compete for that job or be a backup or whatever. I, I could definitely see that. He's got massive hands. He's got like 10 and a half inch hands, which will appeal to John Schneider. Great character. So I, I definitely can imagine him. And you know, physically, he's all right. He's a good athlete. He's not got a massive arm, but he's, his arm is okay. He's good enough. It's good enough, but it's definitely not on the level of like Levis, Richardson, Stroud, in my opinion. I don't think it's even on the level of Dorian Thompson Robinson. So, uh, but I can imagine Seattle being interested in Hendon Hooker, and he's here to, to Detroit. Clark Phillips, I think, is a bit overrated. Uh, he goes to Jacksonville. Trenton Simpson, again, which is what I like about this mark. Uh, the fact that Trenton Simpson later on, he had a very disappointing, I'd say a poor 2022 season. He switched from being just like a Jamal Adams blitzer into, uh, you know, like specialist blitzer into an actual linebacker this year. And he missed tackles. He was anonymous in a lot of games. I, I just didn't think he played very well at all. And he's a great athlete, but he's a great athlete. That's what he is. And people thinking he's going to like come into the league and be a great linebacker. I, I, he may never be anything more than a great athlete for me. And, and there have been Clemson linebackers who come into the league and are just great athletes, not great football players. And I think that's what he may be. So I'd be a little bit worried taking him around two, and I don't think he's going to go as high as some people do. When I see him, there was like a 10 mocks in a row I read that used to have a Trenton Simpson at number 20. I'm glad that that's changing now, but maybe people are actually watching the tape. Uh, Julius Brent's at 
in round two, I think it's a bit high. He's got great athleticism. He's going to test brilliantly, and I like his size. And on the outside, when he's covering on the outside, very, very good. As soon as you get him inside and trying to cover any inside routes, ooh, it is messy. So that is a worry. Need some major technique uh, work there. When, when you know, if I was lining up against him, if I was playing against him, I'd just say right, in cutting route, in cutting route, in cutting, and he can't cover it or try and get him crossing. I mean, he just his his wheelhouse. He's comfortable running downfield in a straight line. 1v1. Getting working over the middle, that's a problem. Uh, Ty J Spears, fantastic player. I had him in round two before the Senior Bowl. He has solidified that at the Senior Bowl. Everyone's talking about him and saying how great he is. Uh, Dalton Kincaid, uh, I think he'll go a lot higher than this, but I can see him lasting this long just because he's, according to Jim Nagy, is out for the whole of the pre-draft process. He's injured and he's not going to be able to test the combine. He didn't wasn't able to do anything at the Senior Bowl. Might not even have a pro day, so he could sink as a consequence. Detroit with BJ Ojolari. I think this is too late for him. I think he's going to go earlier than this. Good character, good athleticism, good uh, play at LSU. Felix and then DK Ozoma, I think, is... I don't know. don't even know what to think about him. I want to see him test. He's, he's one of those where it could go either way. I just don't think he's... It doesn't excite me that much as an edge rusher. But let's see how he tests. I, I reserve the right to change that opinion. And then Philadelphia, the last pick around to JL Skinner, who is the closest thing to Cam Chancellor since Cam came into the league. He's obviously not Cam Chancellor, but hits, it's big, it's physical, it's fast. I think he's a good player and uh, an interesting, an interesting prospect. Who the Seahawks may be interested in, or they may be not, because they've got a lot of uh, a lot of things to get done in this uh, draft season, and another safety might not be uh, top of the bill. So there we go. That's the uh, the mock draft I wanted to highlight. I think it's interesting. Let me know what you think in the comments section. And um, yeah, I think what we what ultimately it, it's going to come down. This is the good thing about it for, for the number five overall page. To go back to that for a second, is the Seahawks are either going to get one of those top three quarterbacks, or they're going to get one of Jalen Carter and Will Anderson. And that's the good thing. And I, and I think we should view it like that. I mean. I see so many mocks that have like the Seahawks like second Tyree Wilson. It's too early for that. We've got to see how Wilson tests the combine. Like just sort of lazily going, oh, well, Carter and Anderson are off the board, so let's just chuck in Tyree Wilson. I think you're better off doing what Mel Kuyper did, which is if those two defensive players are gone, rather than just going to like the next defensive player on your list at number five, put a quarterback in. Be 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 prepared to put a quarterback at number five. You know, if one of the top three last there is what I would say to anybody doing any of these mock drafts. And um, and yeah, I, let's see what Will Anderson does. Uh, not Will Anderson, Tyree Wilson does at, uh, at, the, at the combine before we anoint him. Like fifth. And, and to be really honest, you know, the Seahawks are going to get two top 10 picks out of the Wilson trade. If they come out with Charles Cross and Tyree Wilson, and I said this before we see Wilson testing, I know that'd be a little bit disappointing for me. I kind of hope that we're going to hit a home run with one of these picks. And, and I'm not sure that will be hitting a home run. I think you'd just be adding players who can be decent rather than special. So anyway. That's all I've got for you today. SeahawksDraftBlog.com for more analysis on the draft. And check out the channel. Subscribe if you haven't already. Great interview there. Uh, if I say so myself, I mean, I really shouldn't call my own interviews great. Right? But an interview with Addy Addy from Northwestern. Uh, that's, that's all I'm going to refer to him as. Great interview on there. Um, one of the senior bowl stars. Go and check that out, please. If you want me to do more of the player interviews, let me know in the comment section. But check them out. You know that you've, you've got to watch these if you if you want me to do more of them. So go and check out Yaddy's uh, interview out, which is on the channel now. Silshaplog.com for more. Subscribe, like helps with the algorithm. Uh, comment in the comment section. Let me know what you think of this mock draft. Let me know what you think about the draft in general. Until next time, bye for now.